as one of the most sought after urban lit authors of the hip hop generation, our next guest has the unlikely tale of going from prison inmate to four time New York Times best selling author. I've got to hear this wow. story. And here to talk about the release of her 14th book, her 14th book. <sighs> And to talk about her time behind bars with prison mate Martha Stewart is Wahida <laughs> Clark. Welcome to Arise 360. Thank you. I don't Welcome. even know where to begin. I mean, goodness. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but let's start with the new book, Blood, yes. Sweat, and Payback. Blood, sweat, mm. and I like payback. the title. Now, this is actually the final chapter of your Payback series. Absolutely. Okay, That's so what can we expect? Part four. Part four. Part so what mm -hmm. can we expect this time? Woo. Well, in part three, Payback Ain't Enough, two of the main characters, they did their dirt, lots of dirt, got away, got on the plane, okay, we're gonna start all over. What did they do? They got dragged back they in. They turned back around and go right mm. back. Mm. 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 <laughs> why, it, why does that always happen? Addicted to that life. Mm -hmm. Addicted to that life. The street life can be, yeah. 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 And the money, and the fast money. Fast money, mm. right. the downfall of a lot of people. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so why did you decide to conclude this series, though? Because it sounds like it's just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is part four. Part one is payback as a mother, then it's payback with your life, payback ain't enough, and now blood, sweat, and payback. Mm. So it's, it's supposed to be the explosive finale, but so far I got a couple reviews They said, you can give us one more. Yeah, oh. it can so be maybe the, I will. the big payback. Maybe I will. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Might as well. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you've actually started writing while you were serving ten and a half years in prison. Mm. What did you go to prison for, and why did you decide to pick up the pen? I was working for an advertising firm in Georgia. I was a top salesperson. The company was under scrutiny, and when they finally got enough of what they needed, they kicked the doors down came through with the guns and everything else, screaming and hollering, get on the floor, handcuffing everybody. I kept hearing them say, you got the girl, you got the girl. They were talking about me because I was a top salesperson. So to make a long story short, we took the case to trial and the jury found all of us guilty in my charges. I was sentenced to 125 months. Wait, guilty of what exactly? My charges were money laundering, mail fraud, and wire fraud. Now, were you guilty? I was the top salesperson. But were you guilty? Was I guilty? Uh huh. No one says they're guilty, but I was mm. a top salesperson, addicted to the money. The money kept coming in. I just kept going to work, cashing, cashing that paycheck. Okay. Wow. All right. So then how did you discover that writing was something that you wanted to do in prison? I called home one day, maybe about eight months, no, maybe about a year into my prison sentence. I said to my niece, send me some money. She said, Wahida. We'll see what we can do. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean you'll see what we can do? She said, we're packing it back. We're packing everything up. We're going back to Jersey. They get ready to foreclose on your house. They've already repossessed your cars. No one's here to run your businesses. Mm -hmm. We have no money. So that was my wake-up call because in prison, it costs money to live in prison. Plus, I had two teenage daughters out there. My husband, he was incarcerated. So I started praying. I said, I got to do something to sustain myself and set up a foundation for when I get home. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that prayer, I mean, like a couple of days later, I was my job at the prison was the library. Mm. So I'm sitting in the library. I do my usual, do my homework, pick up magazines and books, and I pick up this magazine, and it's this article in there with a sidebar of Shannon Holmes, and it said that he was in prison and he had written a book. Okay. Mm. So I'm like, wait a minute, he's in prison, he wrote a book? So I'm sitting there looking at all the books on the bookshelves. Then I start visualizing my name, Wahida Clark, on the spines wow. of all the books. Mm. And I'm like, okay. This is it. It's legal. It's something I do now. I'm going to write a book. Well, and now, that's what made me start writing. Mm. You didn't only just start writing in prison. You know, most people just exercise. But you actually inked a major publishing deal with a major publishing house. You wrote and released seven novels. You laid the groundwork for your own publishing company. So exactly why were you so lazy in prison? <laughs> you <laughs> like, I'm going to do it all right from behind the bars. <laughs> wow, that's a lot. You've got, you got the hustle gene in you, uh, right? I, I do. Yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. It's in your blood. I do. Yeah. I do. That's at the job. Top salesperson. Mm -hmm. It was like, you got the girl, you got the girl. And then with the writing. Yeah, but just, was it all about the money when you were writing, or was it therapeutic? It was, was it a no, release? It was what all was it? about the money. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I had to set up a foundation. I told you, it cost money to live in prison. Imagine me coming home after nine and a half years in prison to myself, can I get a job? Yeah, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. And that's it, that's unfortunate because you've done your time, you should be given a second chance, but more often mm. than not, we see inmates come out and they still got the scarlet letter in. on their head. Yep. Yeah. And they end up going back to what they did before. 
And that's, that's one of the things I said, oh gosh, I have to do something legal and good so I don't have to go back. And mm -hmm. uh, at nine and a half years in prison, oh. I've seen them come mm -hmm. back. They it's go like home, we throw, we, we throw go, welcome home, I mean, go home parties. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, a few months later, a year later, the same person is back. Mm. Wow. Revolving door. Well, someone who hasn't been back to prison since she was released is Martha Stewart. Go, Martha. <laughs> go, Martha. <laughs> oh, go, Martha. All right. <laughs> what was she like as an inmate? And did you all talk? I mean, did you have tea, crumpets? Um, like, what is it like being <laughs> in jail with Martha Stewart? Okay. Martha came in. She was focused. She was about her business. They mm -hmm. came to see her every day. You know, she had to run her business. And uh, we didn't really hang out, you know, we had the same workout schedule. I would see her working out and say hi, I see her every now and then in, in the mess hall. And What did uh, she do? What was her workout routine in prison? Uh, treadmill. Mm, okay. Uh, elliptical. Okay. You know, whatever. And just walk, we walk around the track because okay. Artisan is huge. Mm -hmm. And also, um, the camp, the prison camp allowed us to do a, uh, like a workshop for the women. So it was like a career day. So Martha did a segment on uh, startup businesses or, or you know, Mm -hmm. uh, trends, business trends, that's what hers was. And mine was on publishing, so. And then before she left, I said, Martha, you gotta look at my business plan for my publishing company. She said, bring it to the library, give me a couple of days, because I had to catch it before she went home. And um, she looked it over, told me what she thought about it, and. Well, you called her your mentor, so what did you learn from her, and does she still mentor you now? No, I haven't been in touch with her okay. at all. And um, I wouldn't say she was my mentor, mm -hmm. um, I just, needed her to look over my business plan and give me some things, <laughs> uh -huh. tweak it and tell me some things, and she mm. did. And she did. Now yeah. you are the official queen of street lit. What do you think of that title? Well, hey, I, I, I've earned it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've earned it. Um, I'm, I am the first uh, urban lit writer to pen a series, like part one, part two, once mm -hmm. I start doing it, everybody start doing it. Um, I have Blood, Sweat, and Payback has an app. Oh. You download the app, you get a sneak peek of Blood, Sweat, and Payback, you get a sneak peek of future books that I've written, The Golden Hustler Part Two. I have a uh, video series of this, uh, why I wrote the Payback series, what inspired it, because I started it while I was in solitary confinement. I also have a audio book on the app and a single with Christopher Williams and Nuance. When you're in solitary confinement, how do you not lose faith? How do you remain focused on a bright future, a future, let alone a bright future? How does it not break you? Prayer and writing. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I say every, solitary confinement is different wherever you go. Where I was at in the federal prison, it was in a county jail in a dorm that was like a fishbowl. It was about uh, 12 women in there, so I wasn't by myself, but we were just locked down 23 hours a day. Seven wow. days a week. Have and you that, watched the show Orange Is the New Black? I haven't seen that. Okay, yet. I was gonna, I was gonna I ask you if that, that is that real or is I that for, seen it for yet. TV? I, I've told someone told me to say, Wahida, you need to be on that show. Uh oh, <laughs> but I haven't even seen it yet. Okay. All right. Well, you have also started a nonprofit to reach back and help other young youth that are in trouble. Why is that so important to you? And tell us about your organization. Prodigal Sons and Daughters Redirection Services. Mm. While I was incarcerated, like I said, it was a revolving door. Yeah. You see generation. You see a grandmother a mother and a daughter all on, on the same, doing time at the same time. Mm. Then on top of that, on top of going back, going, leaving and coming back, they were getting younger and younger and younger. When I saw an 18 year old come in, I was like, that could be my daughter. Mm. And then the young 18 year olds, they didn't have basic life skills. They didn't know that they were supposed to wash their hands when they used the bathroom or keep their six by nine cubicle clean or make up the bed every morning. They didn't have the basic life skills. And one day I asked one of them, I said, where's your mother? She said, in some cr crack house. I said, where's your dad? He's been locked up since I was in, I was eight years old. So my heart just went out to that. And, and <clears throat> Prodigal Sons and Daughters, we have a 12 week mentorship training program, uh, family reorientation, communications, conflict resolution, financial literacy, network, networking, and character building. So we take them through that. You gotta change the mindset yep. or else you will be back behind the wall. Yep. All right. You're right about that. Well, thank you so wow. much for sharing your organization and your story with us. And so Blood Sweat and Payback. Okay. Oh, wait, what's what the website? website? Prodigalsite.org. We're based out of East Orange, New Jersey. Prodigalsite.org. Okay, right. we got it. We're gonna get that site and we're also gonna get the book. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. It's thank available you. wherever books are sold today. All right, you're thank watching you. Arise Entertainment 360. All right.